Okay, so augmented reality behind the scenes, we will try to understand nuts and bolts behind augmented reality technology. I'm Vedran Vujinovic, coming from Comtrade. We decided to make something about augmented reality and to combine it with our um, educational platform that we'll be releasing anytime soon, I guess. And I'm here today to present you how augmented reality works. So, if any one of you, what, what do you think when you hear augmented reality? Most of us think of Pokemon Go as the, the latest big thing. Thanks God, it, it, uh, the hype went down, so no one is talking about it anymore. And, but I have to mention because of, of one thing. In July, that peak there is the release date of Pokemon Go. As you can see, the other one that I'm comparing it with is virtual reality. Virtual reality is already in consumers' hands, devices and games. Uh, they are already full devices that you can buy, that you can use, that you can create content for. And they are also already somewhere around 500, more than 500 games on, on Steam that have VR tag already. So, virtu augmented reality at the moment, the offer of devices is somewhere where VR was in 2013. It's basically in its infancy. So current availability of devices, the most notably HoloLens, uh, Microsoft created it and it was presented somewhere in the beginning of this year. At the moment it's in uh, pre-production, so pre-release. You can buy it as a developer's version, but it's costly. It costs somewhere around uh, $3,000 dollars and still there are not so many people that are creating content for it. What's good about HoloLens is that it's already a familiar, familiar platform. It's Windows 10. The processor is one of the um, 86 family, Intel. And besides that, it has dedicated GPU something that they call the HPU, which is holographic processing unit. It's used for tracking, head tracking, and, and tracking of the environment around you. Uh, Microsoft, why we didn't see the peak uh, on, on that graph in the time of this release is that Microsoft is not calling it augmented reality. It's calling it hologram. So. That, that's a good thing from, from a marketing perspective because a lot of people know what holograms are supposed to be. And that's, that's why they, they try not to use a term augmented reality. Uh, it's, it has really outstanding tracking. I I'm had an opportunity to try it. It's untethered, so all of the necessary devices, all the, all the necessary proce processors, are embedded in the device itself. So you don't have to be connected to anything, to any computer or anything other. Uh, bad things are that it's still in production, pre-production. Not so not necessarily bad, but it's, it's still not in consumers' hands. Um, it's fairly expensive. And the other thing that is really annoying, yeah, please enter. It is that it has really small field of view. So why field of view is important for augmented reality and it's more important than for virtual reality devices. In virtual reality, if you have a small field of view, everything around it is black. So it's not so dis distracting as for augmented reality. For augmented reality devices, if you have a smaller field of view, you are basically getting one small translucent window in front of your face that you are using as a peephole to, to find virtual objects. So it's really annoying. Microsoft promised that they will increase field of view by the time device has market. Another notable mention, this one is uh, created as a crowd, crowdfunding project. Uh, 
first first round collected somewhere around 200 uh, something thousand dollars and it's created by a guy that has no prior experience with augmented reality the first device that he created was basically created with some cardboards some displays and and hot glue guns nothing other right now this device got uh, Series A investment of $23 million. It's much cheaper. It's under $1,000. It's still in pre-order, not even in, in pre-release, but pre-order. So you cannot still get it and play with it. Great thing is that he has large, really large field of view. It's somewhere around 120 degrees. So it's almost covering our, our own natural field of view. Um, not so good things about it, it's that it, it's tethered to a PC. It needs a computer's horsepower to track, to render, and to do all those things that are necessary to, to show augmentation to, to the user. And the other thing, I, I, ha I didn't have an opportunity to try it, but a lot of other reviews are showing that, yeah, are saying that it doesn't have really good tracking. So if you move your head fast enough, the objects will fly away or will disappear or something like that. Uh, the other, those are two devices that are almost ready to be in consumers' hands. All the other devices are either used for some research projects but not ready for consumers. They are not well-rounded as a consumer devices. There's one third company. I don't know if you heard about it, Magic Leap. Um, they operated as a stealth company since 2011 until 2014, so no one knew anything about them. In 2014, Still, no one would knew anything about them even then, but they received huge investment from Google. It was half a billion dollars. And from 2014 until now, they managed to gather somewhere around 1.4 billion dollars of investment from Google, from uh, Alibaba Express, from uh, Alibaba Group, actually, and also from Players like JP Morgan, which is, is not in, in tech so much, and also from Warner Bros. And, and others. The thing is, it's a huge mystery. They haven't presented any of the technology or anything. They haven't said anything what they are actually creating. They received so many investments, huge investments from big players, and most of the talks that you can find on the internet about what, what they are trying to set, create is mostly speculation. So it's based on patents, some extrapolations, or some rumors, or whatever. Um, the thing is, I'm just hoping that their, their name is not you know, magic for smokes and mirrors and leap of fate that their investors are making. But if their investors are right and they manage to see what they are creating, we are expecting something revolutionary. So they are, because of not only Pokemon Go, but, but other uh, things that were happening, Magic Leap, HoloLens and everything, there are a lot of new players that are jumping the train. Facebook, Apple, Apple started stealing engineers from, from other companies to create an uh, uh, aug augmented reality team. And also there is Snapchat and the rest. So there is a lot of movement in augmented reality, and the momentum is maybe even higher than what, what was previously seen in, in virtual reality. But we have to wait for all those devices to start working with them, to start playing with them. And the thing that I talk with, with uh, one of the, the audiences there 
is that we already have, and Pokemon Go showed us that, we already have perfectly fine devices to start playing with and to use them. So all of those, those devices are present in our own pockets of somewhere around 2 billion people, by, by some estimations, on, on Earth. So if we start, if we wait for those previous devices to show up, we need also to wait for them to be bought by other users, so the market will spread. This one are, these ones are, are already here, and we can start using them and, and create amazing user experiences for augmented reality. So today, I'll be talking about what it makes, what makes augmented reality tick. What are the things, and how the the most basic pipeline, sorry, how the most basic pipeline of augmented reality looks. Why I'm telling you this is because I believe that um, understanding how something works is is, is really important perfectly because once you start using it you have to know how what its limitations are and also how can you use it to full potential so i'll be talking about the the basic pipeline of augmented reality that can be used with those mobile devices so most of it is software um, tracking and rendering what augmented reality is using is uh, we need two fields of, of um, computer science. One is computer vision, and the other one is computer graphics. Computer vision we use for analyzing the pixel arrays, the image that we are receiving from camera, to be able to understand and reconstruct what, what is seen on those images. We perform that analysis and we are getting a model of the thing that is shown on, on that picture. On the other hand, computer graphics is trying to take a model and create an image from scratch. So both of those fields are used in augmented reality. Okay, so in order to, to start augmentation, most usually we we need to have some kind of targets. Previously, uh, those fiducial markers, those black, clunky targets were used because of performance, mostly. It, the devices previously were not so um, efficient, so we would be able to track the surrounding around us. And people started using fiducial markers because it's much easier to detect and track markers that have wide, fat, black borders around it. And in center of it, you can, you can see some black and white pattern that can be used as, um, that can be interpreted as bit mask. And with that way, that would be used as a ID for the virtual object that we want to augment on, on that marker, exactly. The other option is to use planar images. And planar images are great because you can use whatever you want. You can create planar images from a picture on your wall, from a book cover, or a page in, in a magazine, or even uh, a picture of uh, your top of your desk or some part of your floor. So it doesn't have to be any marker that you need to put on a, on a place where you want something to be augmented. Uh, sometimes this is, this is called markerless tracking, but I will show later on what is markerless, true markerless, without any marker. And that's something that um, HoloLens and, and other devices are doing, the true markerless. This is mostly more correctly called natural feature tracking. So we need to have a way to detect and track some parts of the frame <laughs> to use that as a marker. So since I mentioned features, I would like to talk about what features actually are. 
So what computer is getting is, a, is an array of pixels. Those are basically array of, of integers, nothing other. So we have to make a logic for it to be able to see and understand how s what, what is on that picture and how to match that picture to the f current frame that we are getting. So an analogy that, yeah, you can see it, great. Uh, analogy I'm trying, I'm mostly using there is jigsaw puzzles. We've all used them. And mostly how we start with putting those pieces together, you know. We are trying to find corners first, it's, it's normal, all four corners there, and then we put the border together, and then the hard part starts. We have to locate the exact piece on the cover image, which one, where to put it, and, and so on and so on. So how, how is our brain doing that? It's mostly a mystery. It's something that we learn to do. It's something that we learn to do since our childhood, and it's hard to, to describe it. But most of the times we are looking for pieces that are somehow special, somehow unique. So we are looking for some corners, for some crosses, for some blobs that are specific. And maybe some, some pieces with some specific color so we can match it and find its place in the, in the big picture. Once we put together those pieces, if we are left with some huge chunk of, of sky, single color, it's really hard to put that because it's really hard to, to find which part of, of the sky fits where. So if you see, for example, in the fir first row there, A, B, C, I believe you can easily spot them on, on the picture. So A and Bs are the corners, that one and that one of the building, and C is this one here. But if we take second row, D, E, F, it's almost impossible to, to locate exactly where they are in the picture. Because they, they look similar to the rest of the picture. So for, for example, D is this edge, but is it here or is it there? E is this line here, so we don't know if it's here or there. F is some part of a uh, facade. So computer vision tried to mimic that logic of, of finding some unique features some corners, some crosses, and some blobs. So we have came up with something that is called feature detection. So once we uh, pass this image through, through a feature detector, those circles there are actually the features that detector found. Those are interest key points. And you will see that those unique features that we recognized even earlier, corners and the blob here, have the, the most of those circle, circles clustered there. So the detector found the most interesting things on the picture. If you see other places like the sky and, and facade there, these edge here, they don't have any circles because they are not interesting. How do we do that? It involves a little bit of math. So I will not go into that. Mostly it's done by having a patch, smaller patch of image. So once you find a place that maybe is something interesting, you try to move it either in, in each direction. So if the so-called gradient changes a lot by moving that patch around, you know that we have uh, unique feature. So if the patch is somewhere there in the corner and we move it in every direction, gradient will change a lot. But if we find a patch here on the edge, if we move it horizontally, the gradient will change. But if we move it vertically, gradient will not change. So it's not a good feature. And we will discard it. 
sorry. So, why are we using local features at all? Why are we not just trying to find global things? Like, we have uh, an image of a target, and we want to locate it in a, in a current frame. Um, the thing is that when you have a global image, and you are trying to, to globally locate it, you can locate it maybe in a frame that is almost the same as, as that target image. But if you move camera from to the other side and you look at that image from an angle, it's really hard to find it. It's really hard to match it. With local features, besides having that locality, you have distinctiveness also. So each small feature is distinctive. It's, it's unique for itself. And by that, you have a quantity. You have thousands of those features that you can match. So even if a part of an image is occluded somehow, and 500 of those features are missing, are not able, you are not able to see them, still you have five, 500 of, of other features that you can use for matching. So, <coughs> oops. <laughs> um, so you see here, uh, we, we need to have feature features and feature detectors to be able to match image from different perspectives, from different view views. So for example, if we located these five features, we need to locate as many as possible on the other picture. And that truck toy over there is shown from this different perspective. So we were able to match only three features. But because we, we managed to match those, we are able to say with some certainty, yeah, that's that truck. But in order to, to match feature to feature, we need to find a way to, to match them, not one-to-one -one brute force, like, for example, matching pixel by pixel of each patch, and then match pixel by pixel with another patch, and deciding if that one matches the other. We need to find a way to describe somehow those features so we can have so-called uh, distance function built in in those features. And it will be able, it, it will be much better and also efficient to match those features. So those are called feature descriptors. And we need to somehow describe them in a way that they will be used easier for matching. So each feature, will, feature descriptor will, be, will have built-in distance function. Uh, this, is, this is an image from a feature detector called SIFT. And all it does is, is taking a key point of, of a detected feature, expanding the patch around it, calculating, calculating um, pixel gradients, and using that to create 128 dimensional vector. So once we have that 128 dimensional vector, we can use it to, to measure the distance with another 128 dimensional vector. Either it's Euclidean distance or Hamming distance or whatever distance, doesn't matter. You ha only have to define a distance function and you'll be able to match it. So if the distance is smaller, you know that it's almost a perfect match. If the distance is larger, you know that those matches are, are not correct. Um, the thing is, there are a lot of different feature detectors and feature descriptors. So each of them are doing things a little bit differently. Someone, some of them are efficient, some of them are not. Mostly uh, examples that you can find on the internet are SIFT and, and SURF. Uh, they are using feature descriptors that have, as I said, 128 dimensional vectors. And they are using floating point numbers. Floating point number is 4 bytes, so it's uh, 512 bytes per feature, which means that if we have thousands and thousands of features on, on an image, it's really costly for the memory. So you cannot use it so, so good for in um, 
embedded devices or, or so. So there are other types of features, free curve and, and latch, that those are robust implementations that basically they are doing also detection and description of the features. And besides, SIFT and SURF are patented, so in order to use them commercially, you have to pay a li license. Orb, for example, is, is completely free. So here is the first step in, in the pipeline. We've detected features on a target image, and we want to match them to the features we detected on a current frame. As you've seen, matching is almost perfect. There are some cases where, for example, that green line there, it matched some feature from the corner of that corner there. So I I it's we will always get some false positives and false negatives. And there should be a way for us to try to remove as many of those false positives and false negatives. And to not bore you wi with the details, there are some statistical, some it iterative ways of deciding which one of those are good matches and which, which are not. Most notably is, is something called RANSAC. It's random sampling and consensus. So basically what it does is taking any random vector from those two matched features and seeing how many of, of other vectors are aligned to that. If there are enough, a lot of vectors that are aligned, it means those are so-called inliers, and everything other that is not aligned, they are called outliers, so we can remove them with some certainty. So, as you've seen, you, you can see there, those disappeared. We've got ourselves good matches. So what, what we need to do next is to get a perspective, projective actually, projective matrix that transforms that object into projectively there, where it's, where it's located in a field of view and how it's located. And that's something that's called homography. In most of the um, computer vision libraries, that's basically just a one function call that will give you the, the matrix of projection of that uh, rectangle to the one there. So once we've got homography, basically we are almost done. From homography, you can uh, estimate the, the position of that object in a current frame. And that's called pose estimation. Um, wha what we are doing with pose estimation is trying to find where camera, physical camera, is located uh, corresponding to the object and how that object is placed in the scene. So in the end, we will be getting something that's called um, Model, model view projection matrix, which is used in most of the graphics APIs for placing some object in, in a 3D world. Um, for pose estimation, we have to, besides homography matrix, we have to use something, some of the par parameters from uh, camera calibration. So camera calibration, uh, you've probably seen when you take a picture especially when you take a picture with DSLRs and, and those fisheye lenses, you've noticed some distortions on the edges, okay? And those dis distortions are really bad for estimating some position of, of an object in, in, in a frame. So in order to correct and, and accurately estimate the position, we need those parameters of, of focal length and also something called um, distortion, distortion matrix. And that's, that's a process that is done only once. Every camera has specific, unique, uh, intrinsic, uh, extrinsic par parameters. So basically, in the end, you are just doing some matrix to matrix operations and you will get so called MVP matrices. So just to explain you quickly what MVP actually means and what is model, what is view, and what is projection. 
So every 3D model in the space uh, is defined by its vector, by the position in, in some coordinate system. In the case of a model, model has its own coordinate center. And if you if we want to offset that model a little bit to the left and rotate it a little bit, we have to apply um, so-called modal matrix transformations. If we want to place that model somewhere in the scene or world, we have to place to apply world view uh, matrix transformation matrix. And the other thing is that we want camera to be placed somewhere so it would look where it would look and show us the, the scene there. And that's called projective matrix. So once you get those three matrix, you can apply them and get the render of the scene, and that's it. Basically, we are done there. So this is how the, the typical... Okay, I have enough time. This is typical pipeline, the most simple one that you can create to have augmentation. So just to, to summarize, we have camera frame, we are detecting features, we are extracting feature descriptors, we are performing matching, homography, pose estimation. Pose estimation will give us model view projection matrices and we can perform a render. That's it. This is the simplest possible and as you can see here we are doing matching detection of a target on each frame that can be approved by that that those those operations of detection extraction and matching are really really costly they are not efficient so the the frame rate will probably drop by each frame so we can improve that by introducing something called additional tracking. So once we have detected an object and we've extracted all the, the descriptors, we have key point interest, we don't need to detect that object over and over again while it's in a frame. So we can use some things as, as optical flow algorithms like Lucas Canade or the rest to try to predict where those, um, where those key points, where those features are moving from frame to frame. So we don't have to perform matching every time. Once the, the, those key points are out of the field of view, out of the frame, then we can start again matching and try to find that object again. Once we found it, we can continue with tracking. So that way you can, you can use also uh, augmented reality on, on really low power devices because it will not perform detection every frame. So um, you th this is the, the simplest form of augmented reality. So this is the simplest pipeline. Uh, you can maybe understand the problem here because when we are looking for a target, the moment that that target is out of the field of view, we can no longer augment anything because we don't know where we are in the, pl in the space. There are other algorithms that are used. I don't know if. Wait. Let me just. Okay. Um, and this is this is really. Um, markerless tracking, and this is the future. This is already been used by by those devices that, that you can see. So um, the the problem that we are calling SLAM, which is an acronym for simultaneous localization and mapping, is a problem, and it's not one single algorithm. It's a collection of algorithms that th they are being used mostly in robotics. And lately, those self-driving cars are using a lot of SLAM because they are trying to find their way in unknown environment. 
And this is being done by basically locating, this is Visual Slam. It's being done by detecting all the features in, in an environment and performing so-called visual odometry to try to map them, all of those features in the space. So in the end, we'll be getting a, a point cloud of all the features. And in a way, we'll be getting a model of, a, of our surrounding, of our environment. So that way, once you have a model, you will be able, able not only to, to do augmented reality, but you will be able to do something that's called mixed reality. With augmented reality, you can only perform augmentation on, a, on an image. With mixed reality, you are able to have your virtual objects to interact with your environment because you have a model. When you throw a virtual Pokeball on the table, it will bounce and maybe fall to the floor and hit the wall. So there are, there are many, many algorithms uh, used in, in SLAM, and that's topic for on itself. So I will not bore you with that. So what's the future? Um, as you can see there, the Business Insider had an had a article about virtual reality and augmented reality, and the, the market will reach, by day projection, uh, 162 billion by 2020. Um, that's their projection. Probably it will be even higher. Uh, why they're using virtual and augmented reality together, I don't know. To be honest, I don't think those, those two technologies will be competing with each other for the same market share because they are covering totally different things and totally different needs. Virtual reality will be mostly used in, in safe spaces because if you are running in, in a virtual world, you don't want to hit the, the non-virtual wall. And augmented reality can be used in, in many different surroundings. And it will cover totally different user experiences. Uh, on the other hand, a couple of months ago, I think, yeah, um, there was a, a news about Samsung that patented its smart lenses. So basically, their patent says that uh, from this side of your, they will have basically a CCD chip, and from the other side, it will it will have um, some kind of some form of display. So you will not have to to bring those clunky huge devices on your head outside, but you, you will be able to use only lenses. Um, so just by this, you can imagine full potential. To be honest, I cannot even imagine what user experiences this will bring. So I'm telling you all this, that probably this is the perfect time for all of us to, to start playing with this, because we will be pioneers of creating new user experiences and new ways to interact with computer and also interact with each other. <coughs> so thank you for uh, your attention. And if you have any questions, whatever, ask. <laughs> yeah, uh, who asked that? Ah, okay. So at the moment, I, I didn't make a slide uh, for that. At the moment, there are maybe five or six frameworks that you can use for, for creating augmented reality uh, content. Most notably, for example, the, the, the most popular one is, is called from a company called Euphoria. And that framework has really good image, planar image tracking, and also implemented to a certain level, SLAM. So besides that, uh, they have also plugins for Unity, Unreal, and, and those type of engines. 
So you don't have to understand the pipeline and, and put it all together to be able to create content for, for augmented reality. So you can check it. Uh, Vuforia, Easy AI, AR, uh, Kudan. And there's, there's also one uh, open source called AR Toolkit. It was recently bought by, by one company called Dakri. And they open sourced it again. And with that, they released also uh, features that were only behind the, the enterprise license. So it's fully functional. I have no idea. I don't. I don't want to. Honestly, it's it's really hard to predict things, and it's. But do you see a killer feature now? A killer feature now, the use case. The use case. Uh, which one? And and there there is something already like that you know i um, just maybe a year ago i was i was looking for ski those ski glasses you know and i i found some of them on on amazon that had you know augmentation and display in front of you they didn't have you know the lines or so but they were showing you the altitude uh, yeah the map and everything so the name of the ski the for example yeah but the thing is, the thing is, it's really hard to even imagine new user experiences. You know, I'm I'm not so creative. I can just imagine when when some creative people jump on a train, what they will make. For example, Magic Leap, uh, besides um, collect gathering so many inv investments, they also managed to attract and hire really high level, high profile um, engineers, game designers. It's unbelievable. Uh, they even hired sci-fi author Neil Neil Stevenson. I, I, he's their chief futurist. Whatever, <laughs> yeah. So I can just imagine what they will come up with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, can AR now be used only for rigid objects? Wha uh, what do you mean by rigid objects? Uh, Yeah, that, that's the thing about locality of features. So I will leave this here. Um, when you deform, you will lose some features, okay? But a, a lot of other features will stay there. They will be visible. So you can use it with deformed targets. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's why I'm, I'm. I was showing you how it works. You know, so you would be able to understand its limits. Yeah, yeah, fluids are limitations, for example. A or if if you want to track a piece of wall, I mean, it doesn't have any any unique features to, to track. So, or piece of white paper. But having some some uh, target that has a lot of corners and a, a lot of unique features, you can you can track it. Or, I don't know, if you try to use the, one of those devices that have SLAM, if you try to use it in a foggy environment, you cannot expect it to track anything. I mean, w we cannot find our way in a, in a fog. So. Uh, from a business standpoint, um, for example, now if I want to make an app, I can go to two kids sitting yeah. on the couch and make a great app. How democratic is augmented reality? Or when is it that everyone will be on it and I can just pick up the phone and, and make a cool thing out of it to sell it to whatever? And the second part of the question is, what happens when the market is completely flooded with this thing? So let's say I have my contacts on, I go to the supermarket, and this is just a disaster. Because every single cereal box is going to want to talk to me and shit. So when is, when is enough enough? And what's the projection of people with this? Yeah. Uh, Your glasses will not be so smart to say, show me the cereal, but don't show me the coke. Yeah. Uh, we would probably let me address the the second part. If you we would probably have ad blockers, again. So it's it's nothing new. I mean, 
uh, when enough is enough, that's something that, I mean, take a look at, at uh, Google Play Store. There are a shit ton of games. Some of are good, some are bad, but only those that are really good, that are really, you know, taking your focus, they, they, will, they will jump out of, of the, the competition. Uh, on the other hand, the business model, Pokemon Go showed us that really it's ready. You know, they, they earned, I don't know how many, hundreds and millions in, in just a couple of months. So you can immediately, that, that's why I'm, I'm telling you about this. It's a really good time because market is not saturated. You can start. Mm -hmm. my, my question goes more on the, I don't know how much Nintendo invested to make Pokemon Go work. Let's say a couple hundred million dollars, I don't know. Uh, normal people don't have that kind of money. So let's say that I'm a small marketing agency that want to target a little bit of thing. I probably I need to call Comtrade and they will tell me, oh, this is uh, 150,000 euros to make this thing. And so I'm, I'm yeah, asking yeah, yeah, the democratization of the Okay, so uh, you could call Comtrade, definitely. But uh, you, you can do it alone. For example, Euphoria, uh, the SDK that you can take to play with as a developer for some prototyping, it's completely free. So you don't have an, you don't have to invest there. Uh, for everything other, like, I don't know, 3D models, animations, whatever you can, or do it yourself, or hire someone to, to do it for you, or buy those models on some stock, uh, you know, places where you can buy models. Uh, for example, Talking Tom, do you know that, that game? Yeah, it's a huge game, stupid. Uh, but they, when, when they created the game, they, they didn't have internal designers, they, they, the modelers. They bought the, um, the model of a cat for 60 something dollars. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, if uh, anyone in the room is into this and can sell me a few of these features, because I'm in marketing, I'm not a tech guy, please, uh, at the end, if you can just approach me, it would be fantastic, yeah. thank you. Sure. So the, the thing is, uh, all of us, we can, we can jump on, on it. So you don't have to be a developer to, to start, okay, I have six more minutes, uh, to, to start working on that. I mean. Uh, augmented reality is, let's say, everyone will, in, in the next couple of years, everyone will try to, to go and find the gold, definitely. Uh, so it, it would be good for some of you to go off and, and try to find the gold. For some of us that are not creative or marketing or whatever types of people, uh, you know, the, the best business model when everyone is looking for, for gold is to sell shovels. So uh, for, for us, the best way is to maybe create some, some additional tools, some additional improvements to, yeah, so that's another business model for, for augmented reality. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.